have been looking at the counterfeit of what Satan is doing to, to counterfeit what our Lord has promised in His Word. We've been looking at spiritual formation and its Eastern mystical roots, and we're seeing how the enemy is duplicating. He, he's lying and deceiving. And through these Eastern arts, he's infiltrating the Christian church. I want to open tonight with a promise in Romans chapter 8. Turn with me there, Romans chapter 8, verse 19. It says, For the earnest expectation of all creation is waiting for the manifestation of of the sons and daughters of God. That's what the entire universe is waiting to see. And that's the one thing that Satan is seeking to counterfeit. Tonight we are going to show what he is doing and how this is coming into our church. Mystery unveiled, the omega of a most startling nature. You remember that in the very beginning, I asked you to make note of that word nature. We know that there's two mysteries spoken of very um, prominently in Scripture. The first mystery that we see is in 1 Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. But in Timothy... Paul tells Timothy, the mystery of godliness is God manifest in the flesh. So what we have seen over the last few messages is that the mystery of iniquity is the exact opposite of the mystery of godliness. Instead of it being God manifest in the flesh, it is evil spirits and demonic forces that are manifesting in human flesh. I'm going to open with a statement from the Lord's servant. Eight Testimonies, page 28. The world is a theater. The actors, its inhabitants, are preparing to act their part in the last great drama Transgression has almost reached its limit. Confusion fills the world, and a great terror is soon to come upon human beings. The end is very near. And we who know the truth should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. We who know the truth, we have looked at that And we've seen that the word truth literally means in the Greek the unfailing verity of God's Word. We who know that He cannot lie, we that have have grown in faith trusting Him should be preparing. Matthew chapter 24 tells us, and this is a common text, this is a common chapter, Most of us know this. In Matthew 24, the Lord says, Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. This was one of the most magnificent structures that had ever been built. And Herod had refurbished the temple after the Hebrew people had come back out of their Babylonian captivity. Jesus said unto them, unto his disciples, See ye not all these things? Verily, assuredly, I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Jesus was speaking not only of the destruction in A.D. 70, but I believe we are yet to see a physical manifestation of this prophecy. Because if you go to Jerusalem today, the wailing wall is still there. 
Those stones that are there have been there for 2,000 years. There are still stones stacked one upon another. And right now in our world, we're seeing the focus on Israel. But what's more important than the physical temple is the spiritual truth which it was a shadow of, which it was a symbol and which it represented. Desire of Ages, page 160 to 161, we are told, God designed that the temple at Jerusalem should be a continual witness to the high destiny open to every soul. But the Jews had not understood the significance of the building they regarded with so much pride, for they did not yield themselves as holy temples for the divine spirit. That glorious building, its walls of glistening gold, representing purity, purity and holiness, reflecting in rainbow hues the curtains that were inwrought with cherubim, the fragrance of ever-burning incense pervading the entire building, the priest robed in spotless white, and in the deep mystery of the inner place, above the mercy seat, between the figures of the bowed worshiping angels was the glory of the holiest, the very presence of the living God. In all these... God desired His people to read His purpose for the human soul. It was that same purpose long afterwards set forth by the Apostle Paul when, speaking by the Holy Spirit, he said, Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Holy Spirit of God dwelleth in you? And as Jesus sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, When shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ." and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound. Do you remember what the Apostle Paul said? He said, The mystery of iniquity doth already work. The mystery of how Satan takes possession of God's temple by yielding to sin and transgression. Because iniquity shall abound. The overspreading of abominations is what the the prophet Daniel calls it. The love of many shall wax cold. And this gospel, the glad tidings of the kingdom, shall be proclaimed in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. You know, growing up as a Christian, I thought the kingdom is Christ's second coming. And I I didn't realize there is a deeper meaning. When you look up the word Kingdom, in the Greek, it literally means the sovereign, the king, and the reign of God. He said this glad tidings of the reign of God shall be proclaimed in all the world as a witness, and then shall the end come. Galatians chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, listen to what the Apostle Paul tells us. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, proclaimed before these glad tidings 
even unto Abraham, saying, In thee, and later on, in thy seed, shall all nations of the earth be blessed. And we looked at this the other night. The word justify literally means to declare and to render just and innocent and clean and pure and holy and righteous and perfect. The scripture foreseen that God would justify the heathen through faith. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. And that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Galatians 3.14 says. It's interesting because it says the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. The word come on means to generate or to bring into being. Jesus went on and said, When ye therefore shall see the abomination which causes desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. When you look this verse up, it says this abomination that causes God's temple to be desolate will stand in the holy place. And the word stand in in Greek means to abide, to literally to covenant and abide. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the world began. No, nor ever shall be. This was the focus of Christ's message in Matthew 24 and in Luke 21 and in Mark 13. The abomination that causes desolation. When the children of Israel had went back and rebuilt the temple after the Babylonian captivity, we talked about the other night that when they built that temple, the Ark of the Covenant had been secreted away, God's servant says. And Josephus also talks about that. They indicate that it was probably the prophet Jeremiah that instructed the priest to hide that Ark of the Covenant. That Ark was the throne of God. Without the throne, the king cannot reign. And now Christ tells us, when you see the abomination that causes my temple, my sanctuary to be desolate, you know it's time to flee. And God's word says that the temple that was desolate was not just the physical temple, it was men's hearts. The prophet Daniel tells us in Daniel 9, Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and my supplications. Let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem, a symbol of his people, from thy holy mountain, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary, which is desolate. When Jesus went into the temple in John chapter 2, many people don't realize there was a veil between the holy and the most holy place. The holy place was known as the tabernacle and the tent of the congregation. And the most holy was the presence of God. And there was a veil that divided those two. But they don't realize that for almost 500 years, there was nothing behind the veil. They had a form of godliness, but no power. Jesus went on 
And he inspired the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians. And listen to what Paul says about this very same event. He says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day of Christ's return shall not come except there come a falling away first, an apostasy, and that man of sin be unmasked and unveiled, the son of perdition, the son of destruction, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called deity or God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, is sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. There may be a physical event that takes place in the Middle East. I'm not denying that. But more importantly, Satan and his fallen angels are going to strive to take possession of the hearts and minds of every man, woman, and child that has not surrendered completely to Christ. Then Paul tells us, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? But now you know he that withholdeth, he that is holding back, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. When you look on the screen and you look on the right-hand side, that is the hexagram. It's called the Star of David by many people. Most people don't realize that symbol was never used in the Bible by God's children. Solomon, there is record that he possibly could have used that when he had went into apostasy. But what that symbol means is even more striking. It is the union of a male and female triangle. One ascending and one descending. It's the same symbol that Hitler used when he developed the symbol for the swastika or when he adopted that symbol. That was actually a, a Hindu symbol and a Buddhist symbol. And we see that same philosophy, that same ideology with the symbol of the yin and yang, which you see below. It is the joining of opposites. And in the occult world, as well as in Eastern mysticism, they tell you on the higher levels, it is the joining of spirit and flesh. The joining of what the pagans say are the heavens and the earth. Revelation chapter 14 and 18 tells us, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And she has become the, she has made all nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The word fornication there means immorality and the illicit union with pagan gods. Revelation 18 goes on and gives us another description of this. He says, the Apostle John says, after these things, after Revelation 14, after the three angels' messages, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud cry, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. For she has become the habitation of devils and the stronghold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hate-filled bird. This is telling us that when Christ returns, every human being on the face of the planet is either going to be filled with the spirit of the living God or they will be filled with with unclean and unholy spirits. History is repeating. 
with the Bible open before them and professing to reverence its teachings. Many of the religious leaders of our time are destroying faith in the Bible as the Word of God, as the Word of deity. We're told in Psalm 33 that by the Word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. That word has power. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. When these men destroy faith in God's word, they take away from men and women the only thing that has power to save them. These men busy themselves with dissecting the word and they set their own opinions above its plainest statements. In their hands, God's word loses its regenerating power. This is why infidelity runs riot and iniquity is so widespread. When Satan has undermined faith in the Bible... He directs men to other sources for light and power. And thus, through these other sources, he insinuates himself. Those who turn from the plain teaching of Scripture and the convicting power of God's Holy Spirit are inviting the control of demons. Criticism and speculation concerning the Scriptures have opened the way for spiritism and theosophy. Those modernized forms of ancient heathenism to gain a foothold even in the professed churches of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to show you how this is happening in our day. The men that I am going to quote, all of these men are part of the emergent church or emerging church movement. Um, ancient mystical practices that they are trying to blend with Christianity. And all of these men are teachers in spiritual formation. They are using what we have been learning to influence the congregations and millions across this world. This is a statement from Professor Marcus Borg. He was professor at Religion and Culture at the Oregon State University. Listen to what he says. Enlightenment as an archetypal, and I may not be pronouncing that correctly, forgive me, as an archetypal religious metaphor belongs to a mystical way of being religious. Outside of the Jewish and Christian traditions, the best known enlightenment experience is the Buddha's mystical experience. He's a professor of religion and culture, and he's saying we need to look to the Buddha to understand enlightenment. And then he says, so it is in the Gospel of John. Enlightenment is a central metaphor for salvation, and this is not true. He says to be enlightened is to be born from above and of the Spirit. In other words, to be born again. Thus, the born again experience, according to Professor Borg, in John is an enlightenment experience. Now, we need to look and see what this enlightenment is. Obviously, he's tracing it back to the Buddha, to the Buddhist religion. Shane Claiborne, another Christian author and Christian activist, says, If you tell me I have to be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God, I can tell you that you also have to sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Because Jesus said that to one guy also. If Jesus said it, can we not take his word literally? Listen to what he says. But I guess that's why God invented highlighters, so that we can highlight the parts we like and ignore the rest. 
This is identical to what Thomas Jefferson did in the Jefferson Bible. He took the parts he liked and he cut out the parts he didn't like. He took out the miracles of Christ. He took out the virgin birth. He took out every statement where Christ declared that he was the Son of God. Listen to what Pastor Tony Campolo said. He said, I learned about this way of having a born-again experience from reading the Catholic mystics, especially the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola. Ignatius Loyola was the founder of the Jesuit movement. He was heavily involved in Eastern mysticism. His book, The Spiritual Exercises, is now being used across the rest Western world by yoga instructors and gurus and Tai Chi and Qigong instructors. They have found that by using what Ignatius taught, they can enhance the practice of their Eastern uh, arts. Like most Catholic mystics, he developed an intense desire to experience a oneness with God. Gradually, he came to feel an intense yearning for the kind of spiritual purity that he believed would enable him to experience the fullness of God's presence within. Another leader, Brian McLaren, he said from, this is from his new book, A New Kind of Christianity. When Jesus promises life of the ages, a far better translation of the Greek, I believe, than eternal life, he is not promising life after death or life in eternal heaven instead of eternal hell. Being born of God and born again or being born from above would in this light mean being born into this new creation. So again, Jesus is offering a life in the new Genesis, a new creation that is of the ages. What he just did was he twisted the Word of God. He made it so complicated. Jesus said, I have given unto you eternal life. Our Father said, I have given unto you eternal life, and this life is in my Son. It means literally you will live forever. What Brian McLaren just said was almost the exact same thing that Pastor Rick Warren is teaching in The Purpose Driven Life. Don't worry about heaven and hell. It's about here and now. Ministry of Healing, page 429, we are told, These theories that God resides in all matter, or pantheism, if they are followed to their logical conclusion, they sweep away the entire Christian economy, the plan of salvation. They do away with the necessity for the atonement, the at one of man with God and they make man his own savior. These theories regarding God make his word of none effect, and those who accept them are in great danger of being finally led to look upon the whole Bible as a fiction. They may regard virtue as being better than vice, but God being removed from His position of sovereignty, the throne of our heart, they place their dependence upon human power alone, which without God is worthless. Now I want to show you something a little more up to date. Listen to what happened at an interview in 1988, Barbara Walters held an interview with George H.W. Bush, George Bush Sr., when he was on his campaign trail for the presidency. And she asked him a question that completely caught him off guard. 
she asked the, the upcoming new president of our nation if he was a Christian because there were things he was saying that were causing the Christians in America to say, finally, we've got a Christian president. This is a good thing. And she wanted to make this clear in her interview. When she asked if he was a Christian, listen to what George Bush Sr. said. He stumbled over his words. He looked down for a moment, and then he answered. If by being a Christian, you ask if I'm born again, then yes, I am a Christian. What many don't realize is that George Bush Sr., George Bush Jr., and Prescott Bush, the grandfather, were all members of an occult society at Yale University. That society was called the Skull and Bones. And in their initiation, they went through a ritual that once it was achieved, you were now classified as a man that had been twice born. Manly P. Hall, one of the, the greatest philosophers of Freemasonry that they've ever had, listen to what he says. Among the ancients, a fabulous bird called the phoenix is described by early writers. In size and shape, it resembles the eagle, but with certain differences. The phoenix, it is said, lives for 500 years, and at its death, its body opens, and there's this flame of fire, and out of the ashes emerges a new phoenix. Because of this symbolism, the phoenix is generally regarded as representing immortality and resurrection. In the Chinese arts, and that's where they got it from, you usually see two symbols that are held higher than all others, the dragon and the phoenix. And often you will see the two intertwined. It means the dragon is the symbol of occult wisdom, and the phoenix is the symbol of rebirth. So through occult wisdom and initiation, they believe that a man can be reborn. Manly P. Hall went on to say, the phoenix is one sign of the secret orders of the ancient world and of the initiate of those orders. For it was common to refer to one who had been accepted into the temples as a man twice born or reborn. Wisdom confers a new life, and those who become wise are said to be born again. Do you know this is the same thing that Satan said to Eve? It's a tree that will make you wise. And the Apostle James says, This wisdom descendeth not from above, but from beneath. General Albert Pike he was a Confederate Civil War general. He wrote the Bible for Freemasonry called Morals and Dogma. Listen to what he says in that book. Initiation was considered to be a mystical death, and the perfect initiate in the Eleusian mysteries was then said to be regenerated newborn and restored to a renovated existence of life, light, and purity. The Bible says professing themselves to be wise, they become dumb. In the ancient system of initiation, the truth seeker must pass through a second birth. And those who attained this exalted state were known thereafter as twice born. This new birth must be personally earned through a complete regeneration of character and conduct. Now I want you to pay attention to his words. This new birth 
must be personally earned. You earn wages. God's Word tells us that the new birth is a gift from God. You cannot do anything to earn perfection and righteousness. This new birth, he says, the ceremony involves a symbolic death, according to Kenneth McKenzie, who is another Masonic author. He writes in the ancient mysteries the aspirant could not participate in the highest secrets until they had been placed in a coffin. In this ceremony, he was then symbolically said to die and his resurrection was to the light. Albert Pike goes on and says, The day has come when fellow craftsmen must know and apply their knowledge. The lost key to their grade is the mastery of emotion. When I was in Chinese Kung Fu and in Qi Gong and in Tai Chi, all of those arts focused on channeling emotion because Satan knows the emotions are the easiest doorway to find access to the throne of your heart. He says, once they have achieved mastery of their emotions, it places the energy of the universe at their disposal. When the mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, then he has learned the mystery of his craft. You remember what Paul said? The mystery of iniquity. Satan works to control our emotions. We know that faith is not based on emotions. Faith is based on thus saith the Lord. Regardless of how I feel, I have to take God's word and say, this is sure. He cannot lie. But the occult world says it's all based on emotions. He says the seething energies of Lucifer, of Lucifer are then in his hands. And before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply this energy. When I was in Chinese Kung Fu and I was working on, on discipleship level, that was the one thing that we had to do. We were told we have to channel this energy that they called chi into our hands and into our arms and move it in the body. And then we had to demonstrate we were, we were able to do that. Some people would demonstrate that through breaking, you know, cinder blocks or stones. Um, some people would demonstrate it through breaking coconuts with their palm. Other people would demonstrate it like the other man and I we had to be able to take our hand and make the hand get hot and the other one freezing cold. And then we were told, make the pointer finger get hot, the rest of the hand freezing cold. Once we had done that, we began practicing with channeling that energy into the hand when we would strike. But all of this were gifts that were given to us by the spirits that had come into our lives. Albert Pike says, he must follow in the footsteps of his forefather, Tubal Cain. He was one of the offspring of Cain in Genesis. Who, with the mighty strength of the war god, hammered his sword into, sword into a plowshare. Incessant vigilance over thought, action, and desire is indispensable to those who wish to make progress in the unfolding or unveiling of their own being. They are showing, like they did in that previous slide, this figure from the Freemasons is showing a mason with a hammer and a chisel cutting himself out of the stone. God's Word says that Christ was the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that we also are living stones, cut 
and chiseled without hands, but by the power of God. Once this progress has been made in the unfolding of their own being, he says the fellow craft's degree is the degree of transmutation. That's another word for transformation. The changing of the character that we were designed to be, the image that we were designed to be into the image of Lucifer and Satan. Now look where all this goes back to. New World Encyclopedia tells us, in Hinduism, the highest three classes of Hindu society are known as the Vija. That means in Hindu Sanskrit, the twice-born ones. Because they have undergone the sacred thread ceremony in which male members are initiated into the second stage of life, called the ashrama of a Vedic follower. This sacred thread ceremony is considered to be a type of second birth. The doctrine of the twice-born has been criticized for promoting hierarchy and elitism in Hindu society, but its supporters see it as a type of initiation and purification into a higher state of existence. Analogous, analog, forgive me, I can't even pronounce that. Analogous to the baptism of other religions. The British Key Society, it says Zen Buddhism began the idea of understanding life. It suggests that when one understands life, one feels as if one is newly born. That's where the word sensei comes from. That's what a Japanese master instructor is called, a sensei. He says the word sin means before, and say means to be born. So sensei literally means a person who is twice born or born before. This birth is a spiritual, not physical birth. People tell me all the time, aren't martial arts just about self-defense? That's what Satan wants you to think when you begin. Isn't yoga just about stretching? That's what the serpent, the kundalini, as they call him in yoga, that's what he wants you to believe when you begin. But the masters will tell you, the gurus will tell you, this birth is a spiritual, not a physical birth. The original meaning of sensei is one who is spiritually born before others. Desire of Ages, page 35. Satan was seeking to shut out from men a knowledge or knowing of God and to turn their attention from the temple of God and to establish his own kingdom. Through heathenism, Satan won his great triumph in perverting the faith of Israel. By contemplating and worshiping their own conceptions, the heathen had lost a knowledge of God and had become more and more corrupt. And so it was with ancient Israel. The principle that man can save himself by his own works lay at the foundation of every heathen religion. It had now become the principle of the Jewish religion. Satan had implanted this principle, and wherever it is held, men have no barrier against sin. We need to ask ourselves as Christians, and even more importantly as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, are we following the footsteps of the ancient Jewish people? Are we striving to earn salvation and to set ourselves free from sin through our own will and works? 
the means by which we can overcome the wicked one is that by which Christ overcame, by the power of the word. The same word that spoke light in the darkness spoke life to the dead. It spoke purity to Mary Magdalene. It spoke wholeness to the leper in Luke chapter 5. God does not control our minds without our consent. But if we desire to know and to do His will, He has promised we shall know the truth and the truth shall make us free. The world is a theater. The actors are its inhabitants. They are preparing to act their part in the last great drama. With the great masses of mankind, there is no unity except as men confederate to accomplish their selfish purposes, and God is looking on. A power from beneath is working to bring about the last great scenes of the drama. Satan coming as Christ and working with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in those who are binding themselves together in these secret societies. The forces of darkness will unite with human agents who have given themselves into the control of Satan. And the same scenes that were exhibited at the trial, rejection, and crucifixion of Christ Jesus will be revived again. Through yielding to satanic influences, men will be transformed into fiends. Look that word up. And those who were created in the image of God, who were formed to honor and to glorify our Creator, will become the habitation of dragons. And Satan will see in an apostate race his masterpiece of evil. Men who reflect his own image. Transgression has almost reached its limit. Confusion fills the world. And a great terror is soon to come upon human beings. The end is very near. And we who know the truth should be preparing for what is soon to break upon this world as an overwhelming surprise. Jesus told us when Satan appears, don't even go and look. Don't cut your television on to see because it will be an overmastering delusion. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel and glad tidings to proclaim to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And listen to what he says. With a loud voice he cries and says, Fear God and give the glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of water. This is the Sabbath. It is a sign that we have faith that the same Word that brought the worlds and the universe into existence is able to recreate you and I in the image of our Savior. Let everyone who claims to believe that the Lord is soon coming search the Scriptures as never before. For Satan is determined to try every device possible to keep souls in darkness and blind their minds to the perils of the times in which we are now living. Let every believer take up his Bible with earnest prayer that he may be enlightened by the Holy Spirit as to what is truth. What is the unfailing verity of God's Word? That he may know more of God and of Jesus Christ whom he has sent. 
search for the truth as for hidden treasures and disappoint our enemy. The time of test is just upon us. She says, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun to sound in the revelation and revealing of the righteousness of Christ as our sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory will fill the whole earth. If you would stand through the time of trouble, the Lord's servant tells us, you must know Christ, for this is life eternal, and appropriate as your own the gift of his righteousness, which he imputes to the repentant sinner. First Selected Messages, page 363. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other, to prepare the way for our King. This is the glory of God which closes the work of the third angel. Then she says in Testimonies to Ministers, page 456, What is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for you and I that which it is not in our power to do for ourselves. Luke 17, listen to what our Savior says. And when Jesus was demanded by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered and said unto them, The kingdom of God, the reign and the sovereign of God, cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom, the reign of God is within you. Nicodemus came to Jesus and he asked the same question. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Except a man be born again, begotten again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus asked, How can these things be? Jesus answered, That which is born of the flesh is just flesh. But that which is born by the Spirit of God is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Now I want to look in our last moments. I want us to see how this happens. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. The Apostle Paul tells us, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? And you look up the word obey and it means have confidence in and believe. Who has bewitched you that you do not believe the word of God? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth and before ordained, crucified for you. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Do you remember how Isaac was born? God came to Abraham and Sarah, and He said, Ishmael, who you had by the power of the flesh, He's not even counted as seed. Of your own flesh, you're going to bear a son. God promised Abraham and Sarah would have that son. And Galatians 4 says, that's why Isaac was born by the Spirit. For as many as received him, John says... To them gave He power to become, to be brought into being as the sons and daughters of God. Even to them that believe on His name, 
John 1, verse 12 and 13. Which are born or begotten, not by blood, nor by the will of the flesh, nor by the will of man, but of God. For of his own will begat he us with the word of truth so that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures, His creation. James 1, verse 18 through 21 tells us. And then Galatians says, Now we, brethren, Galatians 4, 28 and 29, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of God by promise. But just as it was then... He that was born by the flesh persecuted him that was born by the Spirit. Even so it is now. Do you remember what happened in 1888? The majority of God's leaders and the majority of our church rejected the message that Christ had given through Jones and Wagner. They said, we're doing this fine on our own. They repeated what the children of Israel had said at Mount Sinai. The Lord came down and spoke His commandments, His laws of life. And they said, everything you've said, we will do. Ellen White says, every command is a promise. And God says, all that I have spoken, I will do. For it is I that work in you both to will and to do that which pleases me. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 22 and 23 says, Therefore, being born and begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. And this is the word which by the glad tidings is proclaimed unto you. Behold, brothers and sisters, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. It is for this reason that the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now, today, if you will, but hear my voice and harden not your hearts in unbelief. Now are we the sons and daughters of God, and it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appeareth, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 